What's up, everybody? And welcome into the Legal Hands to the Face show with Bill Calarulo. Special edition today, recapping the start of NFL free agency for our Philadelphia Eagles. I know some of you were just here for the Philly Sports Power Hour, but this is the Legal Hands to the Face show. And we also take the audio from this show. We upload it to all your favorite podcast platforms. So if you're listening to the podcast, I appreciate it. Leave me a review on whatever podcast platform you're listening to. Really lets us reach more Eagles fans. But it's been exciting. It's been an exciting start. And a lot of my daily Power Hour crew knows we talk about this stuff every day. But the Legal Hands to the Face show is a weekly show. So we have a lot to cover. A lot to cover over the next hour. So we're going to be here for an hour. We're going to get into some of the recent moves. We'll talk about what I think some of the next moves could potentially be, what I hope they are. We'll look at some of the deals that were made with the current players on this team, some extensions, who could be in line for an extension soon. And then we'll end like we do every legal hands to the face show with a little Philadelphia Eagles trivia. So we'll see if anybody is able to get that. But let's get a little roll call. If you are listening to the audio, we are live on YouTube. We are live on TikTok. So if you hear me referencing the chat, that's what I'm doing because we got a lot of people in the house checking in for this special edition. So Captain Save, <laughs> good morning to you. Jason A-Team in the house, James Jones, Rob at Temple, Mike Fittery, John, Jason A-Team, Flexin and Steppen, Jackson, Jeff Bone, Wine Niners Wine. Who else we got? Josh, John, a lot of people checking in. We're live on TikTok as well. So we're streaming across the Jacob Sports Network. We're also all over my social media, Bill Calarulo Philly Sports Talk. So make sure you're subscribed on YouTube. Make sure you're following me on Twitter and Instagram and all your favorite social media platforms. I see Callie in the house. Junior getting rich on TikTok, checking in. we got a lot of people checking in there as well. So let's start to recap what's happened over the last week. Well, first of all, the last time I spoke on the Legal Hands of the Face show, Fletcher Cox was still considering coming back, but he is, in fact, retired that was expected so now the Philadelphia Eagles lose both Jason Kelsey and Fletcher Cox two moves that we thought were coming so they're not surprising but what do the Philadelphia Eagles do now I look at that defensive tackle room and I think they're going to be fine I think the defensive tackles are the one area on this team where I'm not worried going into 2024 I'm expecting a big second season from Jalen Carter. I'm very high on Milton Williams, who we'll talk about later on in the show because he's a player who's eligible for a new contract entering the final year of his deal. You also have Jordan Davis, who I know some people are down on, but he's a solid player at that D-tackle position. You have Marlon Tupelotu, Mauro Ajomo. So the D-tackle room's fine. They can handle the loss of Fletcher Cox, even though Cox – played really well last season, played extremely well in what is now going to be his last year in the NFL, but he did play well. What I'm more concerned about when I look at the defensive side of the football isn't the loss of Fletcher Cox from a player standpoint. It's who's going to step up and lead that defense. I think they did need a new voice. I think the veteran leadership this team had last year didn't do anything for them to stop the slide down the stretch, the collapse, if you want to call it that, down the stretch. So who's going to take over and lead that defense? The player may not even be here yet. We'll see. Is it going to be a guy like Bryce Huff, who we'll talk about in a few minutes that they just brought in? Is it going to be a Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, who we'll also talk about in a few minutes that they brought back? Is it going to be N'Kobe Dean, if he can show he can play at this level? Because N'Kobe Dean... If he can play at the NFL level, if he could stay healthy, the one thing that you shouldn't question is his leadership ability. He was the alpha on one of the best defenses in NCAA history at the University of Georgia a couple years ago. 
with all the players they had on that defense, the Kobe Dean was the alpha. He was the leader. The problem is you can't lead if you can't play. So I don't care how good of a leader you are. If you can't back it up on the field, if you can't stay on the field, you can't be the leader. So Dean is a potential option to be the leader, but he's got to show he could stay on the field and that he can play. So who else we got? Jonathan Arviso on TikTok says BG. And yes, BG is coming back. He signed another deal. He's coming back for his final year, his 15th season, which is a record most in NFL, or excuse me, most in franchise history. He was tied with Chuck Benderick for 14 seasons. So now have 15. My problem with saying that BG will be the leader is that he's not going to play enough. BG's only going to play probably 20 to 25% of the snaps. So yes, he will be a leader. He always is. He will be a great voice in that locker room, but you need somebody else. We need someone to take ownership and control of this defense. And I see New England shake up checking in on TikTok. I appreciate the kind words, my man. Appreciate you. But I think it's got to be somebody else to step up and take control of this defense. And there are options. I see people talking about Milton Williams can be one of those options. Jalen Carter, maybe. I haven't really seen a lot of leadership skills from him yet, but who knows? Can he step up? You got Hassan Reddick maybe coming back. We'll talk about that later in the show, what I think happens on the edge as well. So that's my big question on the defensive side of the football. You look at the offense. I think there are enough players on that offense that can step up and be leaders. None more than Jalen Hurts. This is a great opportunity for Jalen Hurts to really take ownership and control of this team and its locker room. We've heard that the Eagles want him to be a better leader. Well, here's his opportunity. When guys like Kelsey and Cox are stepping away from the game, who have been the leaders in that locker room for a decade, this is a great opportunity for someone like Jalen Hurts to fully take ownership of this team and be the true leader in that locker room. And in addition to Jalen Hurts, you still have Lane Johnson. We now have Landon Dickerson, who we'll talk about his extension in a second. He can be a leader. A.J. Brown, I believe, is a leader. You have Devontae Smith. So there's a plenty of options on the offense. You have Jordan Maialata, Cam Jurgens. So I'm not worried about who's going to lead the offense. For me, it's who's going to lead the defense. But there's another player that may potentially be a leader on that offense. So let's jump in to free agency because the biggest signing so far, probably in the NFL, Saquon Barkley is a Philadelphia Eagle. We heard rumors all week leading up to the first tampering period, kicking off Monday at noon, and we were thinking, is this possible? Would Howie Roseman really make a splash at running back? Go out of character and make a splash at running back. Well, the reason I thought there was a strong possibility is because we have never seen Howie Roseman have the amount of cap space that he had going into free agency. $43 million in cap space. You already know that one of the things Howie Roseman does better than any GM is work the damn cap. The cap is nothing for Howie Roseman. He's a magician when it comes to the cap. And now you gave him $43 million to spend. So you knew he was going to do some things in free agency, but I wasn't going to fully believe the Saquon Barkley rumors until it happened. And it happened. So the Philadelphia Eagles signed 27-year-old running back Saquon Barkley, three years, $37.75 million. And when the deal came out, I was actually on 97.5 The Fanatic, broke that news to the city of Philadelphia, which was a lot of fun. But I said it to fans who were worried about the number. Don't worry about the total number. It's never about the total number. It's about the cap hit. It's about what it does to your cap. Case in point, Jalen Hurts. They gave him a $255 million contract. Everybody thought that was going to bankrupt the team. But you have to look at the cap numbers. Jalen Hurts' cap hit this year is only $13.5 million. Next year, 
22 million. The year after that, 32 million. The year after that, 46 million. To put that into perspective for you, Daniel Jones is 47 million. This year, Jalen Hurts won't reach Daniel Jones' cap hit for four more seasons. And Dak Prescott's cap hit this year, 59.4 million. Jalen Hurts will never get there in the next five seasons. So it's all about the cap hit. And now that we have the details of Saquon Barkley's contract, of course Howie Roseman was a magician with the deal. In essence, it's a two-year, $26 million deal. I know you see the big number, three-year, 37.75, but if you really look at the details of the deal, it's a two-year, $26 million deal with a team option for year three. Because the way it's structured, the third year, if they wanted to get out from under that contract, if for some reason, which I don't think is going to happen, and we'll talk about it in a second, but if for some reason Saquon Barkley isn't the guy we're all hoping that he is, and after year two, the Eagles want to get out, all they would have to do is cut him with a post-June 1st designation. That would carry an $8.6 million dead cap hit that you can stretch out over two years. So that would mean his dead cap would be 3.8 and 4.6. That is nothing in today's NFL. Nothing. Jason Kelsey has a dead cap hit higher than that for this coming season. And we also know the salary cap is going up every single season. It went up $30 million this year, a record high. It will probably go up again next season, a record high, because it's based off of the NFL revenues, and the NFL is a freaking monster, and the revenues, revenues keep going up, especially now with all these streaming deals. So don't worry about the numbers. And Saquon Barkley's cap hit for 2024 is only $3.9 million. It's 3.9. And I tweeted this out, and it's blowing up. Sports Center picked it up. I think NFL Live picked it up. Deshaun Jackson's talking about it. This went nuts because I added the cap hits of Jalen Hurts, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, and Saquon Barkley for 2024, all four of our stars for 2024, their cap hits total $36.2 million. Jalen Hurts is only 13 and a half. A.J. Brown is 12.4. Devontae's is 6.4. And Saquon's is 3.9. That equals $36.2 million. You just heard me say, Daniel Jones, cap hit. $47 million this year. Dak Prescott's cap hit, $59.4 million this year. And you have Jalen Hurts, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, and Saquon Barkley all at 36.2. Absolutely insane. We can debate, and I have been critical of Howie Roseman when it comes to the draft. I have my problems with the way he's drafted defensive talent. I have my problems with Howie Roseman and the way he built that defensive roster last year. I think the personnel severely lacked. I think that's a lot of what you saw, why this team struggled. I don't care who the defensive coordinator was. I don't think Howie Roseman gave them enough personnel on defense last year. But you cannot debate that the one thing Howie Roseman does better than anybody is work that cap and structure his contracts. That is not up for debate. You can't disagree with it. And this deal that they gave Saquon Barkley again shows why Howie Roseman is a magician when it comes to the salary cap. He is a cheat code for the Philadelphia Eagles when it comes to the salary cap. And I love this move for Saquon Barkley. Because I think what you just did was you added a playmaker to your offense. You added, and I get it, he has to stay healthy. We'll talk about that in a second. But you added a player that could truly change your entire offense. We saw what Christian McCaffrey did when the San Francisco 49ers added him to their offense. That's similar to what the Philadelphia Eagles just did, adding a Saquon Barkley. You know he can run the football. 
You know he can catch the football. And something else that he does that's extremely underrated is his pass blocking, his pass protection, his blitz pickup. You hear that? Blitz pickup. Where did the Philadelphia Eagles struggle immensely last year? Was against the blitz. In week 18 against the Giants. In the wild card game against the Tampa Bay Bucks, they severely struggled against the Blitz. A lot of that was coaching, but it also didn't help that you had DeAndre Swift, who wasn't very good against the Blitz in pass protection. So now you add Saquon Barkley, and he has never, ever played with the type of weapons that he is going to play with in Philadelphia this season. You are putting him on an offense that not only has Jalen Hurts, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, Dallas Goddard, and still a very good offensive line. I know Jason Kelsey retiring hurts, but Cam Jurgens now will move to his natural position of center, and this may be the best offensive line Saquon Barkley has ever played behind. You still have Jordan Maialata, who I expect to be even better this season. He's gotten better every year in the NFL. Another year with Stoutland University. You have Landon Dickerson, who I expect to have another good season and probably a better year as he continues to go through Stoutland University. And you still have Lane Johnson, one of the best right tackles in the league at right tackle. So the big question mark on the offense is right guard. Is Tyler Steen ready? Do they bring someone in? I'm deferring to Jeff Stoutland if I'm Howie Roseman, Kellen Moore, and Nick Sirianni. Is Tyler Steen ready? But even with all of that, Saquon Barkley will play on an offense with more weapons than he's ever had in his life. Let's just look at his NFL career. First of all, look at the quarterbacks that he's had to play with. In 2023, Daniel Jones. Tommy Cutlets, Tyrod Taylor. Outside of his rookie season, it's been Daniel Jones every single year. And you look at the leading wide receivers on the New York Giants during Saquon Barkley's tenure. Listen to this and tell me that you're not excited to see what Saquon Barkley can do on this offense. In 2023, the New York Giants leading wide receiver was Darius Slayton with 770 yards. 2022, Darius Slayton, 724 yards. 2021, Kenny Galladay, 520 yards. 2020, Darius Slayton, 750 yards. And 2019, Darius Slayton, 740 yards. Are you kidding me? The only time this kid, Saquon Barkley, had a 1,000-yard receiver on his offense was his rookie season back in 2018 when Odell Beckham had 1,052 yards. And what did Barkley do that season? When he actually had another weapon on his team, what did Barkley do? He had 1,300 rushing yards, five yards per carry. 91 receptions for another 721 yards. That's over 2,000 scrimmage yards. And now you're putting him on an offense with A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith and Dallas Goddard. I love this move for the Philadelphia Eagles. And I know people out there, I see you in the chat. I know what you're thinking in your head. Well, he's got to stay healthy. He's got to stay healthy. Well, the same people wanted DeAndre Swift back and said, oh, don't sign Barkley, just bring back Swift. Well, in the last three seasons, Devontae Smith, not Devontae, geez, in the last three seasons, DeAndre Swift has played 44 games. Saquon Barkley in the last three seasons, 45 games. People wanted Swift back, and they didn't want Barkley because he's injury prone. He's played more games over the last three years than DeAndre Swift did. And guess what? He no longer has to play half of his season on the crappy turf at MetLife Stadium. What do you think that's going to do? 
to Saquon Barkley's health. So I love this move. I love what he adds to that offense. It's going to be exciting to watch. We got to talk about, though, very quickly, James Franklin, the Penn State head coach, put his foot in his mouth at a press conference talking about how Saquon Barkley told him that part of Howie Roseman's sales pitch to get Saquon to come to Philadelphia was how close it is to Penn State. Well, James Franklin, the NFL legal tampering period doesn't allow agents and, excuse me, the NFL legal tampering period doesn't allow GMs to talk to the players directly. Everything has to be done through the agent. So when James Franklin said, Saquon Barkley told me this is what Howie Roseman said to him on the phone. He wasn't allowed to say that to him on the phone. That would be a violation of the NFL's legal tampering period. That would get the Philadelphia Eagles in trouble. So James Franklin needs to worry about beating Ohio State. He needs to worry about beating teams that are actually good and stop getting the Philadelphia Eagles in trouble, man. Stop. So we'll see what happens with that. It doesn't look like an investigation is being done yet, but it could potentially lead to draft capital punishment if it can be proven that Howie Roseman spoke directly to Saquon Barkley. But I love that move. I think that's going to do a lot of great things for this offense. It doesn't break the bank, especially when you look at the salary cap that's continuing to go up. That's not that much money for a potential game changer. And I still think they have plenty of cap space to do whatever they want. So bringing in a guy like Saquon doesn't prevent you from getting some other players they need, which we'll talk about. The other big splash they made on the first day of legal tampering, they bring in edge rusher Bryce Huff. Bryce Huff from the New York Jets, 25 years old. There's a lot to like about this move, but there's also some things to question about this move. First and foremost, let's talk about the things to like. Bryce Huff, only 25 years old, and he can get after the quarterback. He had 10 sacks last year in limited reps. He only played about 42, 43% of the snaps for the New York Jets, and he still had 10 sacks. His win rate on pass rush, according to Pro Football Focus, is 22.9%. There were only two players in the NFL with a higher win rate, Micah Parsons and defensive player of the year, Miles Garrett. So this is an exciting move. This kid can get after the quarterback. He was undrafted in 2020 out of Memphis, and he's got better every single season in the NFL, and he has double-digit sacks last year. Now, what is there to be concerned about with Bryce Huff? Well, you just heard me say he only played about 42, 43% of the snaps. Part of the reason he only played that minimum amount is because he's terrible against the run. Absolutely terrible against the run. In his four seasons in the NFL, that's something he's really struggled with. So if the Philadelphia Eagles are relying on him to take on a bigger role with this team and with this defense, he absolutely has to get better against the run. If you want him to be an every down edge, he's got to get better against the run. But you got to remember, he's still only 25. And now you're going to put him on a defense with Vic Fangio as the defensive coordinator, who from all accounts is a great teacher. You're also going to add him to a defense that has Clint Hurt, the new defensive line coach who was the defensive coordinator in Seattle. So I'm hoping that they're going to be able to coach this guy up and that we're only scratching the surface of his potential at 25 years old. But pass rushers, they don't grow on trees. And the Eagles got a really good one. There is no denying that this kid can get after the quarterback. And let's go back. 2022, the Philadelphia Eagles defense led the NFL with a record 70 sacks. Well, it's not a coincidence that they also were the number one pass defense that year. When you can get pressure on the quarterback, 
it helps out your secondary. So number one in sacks, number one in pass defense. They come back this year in 2023. They go from 70 sacks down to 43rd in sack. Or excuse me, 70 sacks to 43 sacks. Go from number one down to 19. Well, what happened to their pass defense? They went from number one in the NFL to 31st in the NFL. So, yes, I want to see Bryce Huff become a better run stopper, but we've seen what a strong pass rush can do for everybody on that defensive side of the football. However, as much as I like this move, as much as I like them bringing in Bryce Huff, I only like this move if it means they're keeping Hassan Reddick. So there were reports over the last couple of weeks that not only is Hassan Reddick on the trading block, but also their other starting edge rusher from last year, Josh Sweat. So this move, bringing in a Bryce Huff, what does it mean for those two players? Because I only feel good about it if Reddick is also coming back. So we're going to take a quick break on YouTube. If you're listening to the audio, we'll be right back. I cut out a lot of the breaks. But on YouTube, we're taking a quick break. TikTok, we'll, I'll keep it here with you. But when we get back, I want to talk about Josh Sweat, Hassan Reddick, and what this move can mean for Nolan Smith. Then we'll get into some of the other moves, some of the other free agent signings. We'll look at some of the players they extended, and then we'll look around the NFC, and I'll give you the Eagles trivia. So keep it here. This is the Legal Hands of the Face Show. I'm Bill Calarulo. We'll be right back. Imagine for a moment that you went to work today and when you came home, you were catastrophically injured. Your life and your family's life. That's what happened to union construction worker Mike Little. I was scared of what the end was going to be, but to be 100% honest with you, I knew I was going to be all right just by talking with Brian. In my heart, I just knew everything was going to be all right. Call the firm and find out why they say, we got this. Call 215-458-2222. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Champions on three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA. And the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. And the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles.
What's up, everybody? Welcome back in to a special edition of the Legal Hands to the Face show, recapping the start of free agency. And it is crazy that really NFL free agency didn't start until yesterday at 4 o'clock. We're recording this, if you're listening to the audio, Thursday morning. But yet, a lot has happened. A lot of moves have been made. But later on, after I want to take a look at this Josh Sweat situation, Hassan Reddick situation. But I also want to take a look of why we should calm down a little bit. Because some of Howie Roseman's best moves don't necessarily happen right away every year. So we'll talk about that. But the big question now is they signed Bryce Huff. They bring back Brandon Graham. We know Nolan Smith is going to enter his second year. But both of their starting edge rushers from last year, Hassan Reddick and Josh Sweat, could potentially be on the trading block. Well, from what I'm hearing, I am hearing that Josh Sweat is definitely going to be traded. That it's not a matter of if, it's just simply a matter of when. And I would be okay with that. If they do, in fact, trade Josh Sweat, you have to keep Reddick, though. You can't trade both of these guys. As good of a move as I think the Bryce Huff move is, if you traded both Sweat and Reddick, to me, I don't see how you've upgraded your defense. At that point, you've just replaced them with Bryce Huff. How is that an upgrade? So the way I see it, you look at last year. The edge rushers hit a wall. They had no depth. Reddick and Sweat both played over 800 snaps. And what happened was they hit a wall. Towards the end of the season, you could see it. So we needed more depth. That's why I love the Bryce Huff move. Another body that can get after the quarterback. But I only like it if you figure out a way to keep Reddick. And I'm hopeful they will. But the main reason I'm okay trading away Sweat. I know he's younger. I know he's only 26 years old. Every single season for the last four years, he has gone stretches where he disappears. Last year, he finishes the season with Eight straight games without a sack. 2022, even though we had 11 sacks, there was a stretch in there of five games in a row without a sack. 2021, he went four games in a row. 2020, five games in a row. And his cap hit isn't that terrible this year. It, go, it goes from 5.8 up to 9.1. So not terrible, but I would just be okay you can't have a starting edge rusher that disappears like that. But for them to be able to keep Hassan Reddick, they got to extend him. Not only because Reddick wants a new deal and he deserves a new deal, but Reddick's cap hit skyrockets this year from $7 million up to $22 million. So they could actually extend Reddick and save money on the cap by doing what Howie does, which is backloading the deal kicking the can down the road when you know the salary cap's going to be a lot higher. But I really like this defense if you look at it with Bryce Huff, Hassan Reddick, and BG, Nolan Smith. Nolan Smith's going to be the big X factor this year. Can they get him to play to his potential, the reason they drafted him in the first round? Because if he can, if Nolan Smith can grow into the player we all thought he was going to be, this Eagles defense is going to be able to really get after the quarterback, but I don't want to see them trade Reddick. So we'll keep an eye on that. They let him go out, talk to other teams, see what his market is, see if anybody's willing to pay him outrageous amount of money. And if not, he comes back. They agree to an extension. He's still here. But be on the lookout. I don't know when it'll happen. I don't know if it'll happen closer to the draft or not. But Josh Sweat, from what I'm hearing, is definitely going to be traded. So another player, they picked up some other players in free agency. Before we talk about Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, which I know a lot of people are happy about, they also picked up Zach Bond. So he's a linebacker from the New Orleans Saints, 27 years old, four years in the league. Only started, I think, 14 games maybe over his four-year career, but he has some versatility as well. Not only is he a linebacker, you may see him fit similar to that Andrew Van Ginkle role that Vic Fangio had him playing in Miami where Zach Bond can not only play off-ball linebacker, he can also line up on the edge and bring some pressure on the quarterback as well. So I expect him to mix in a little bit there. He's also a special teamer. I don't think he's going to move the needle that much, but this is another guy 
that can rush the quarterback. And that's what you want. You want to be able to rotate players through so they're fresh. So you don't have what you had last year, which is Sweat and Reddick playing a majority of the snaps and hitting a wall towards the end of the season. They bring in Matt Hennessy, Temple kid, offensive line depth. Didn't play all of last season because of an injury, but you add him to Stoutland University. What's he going to be able to do? They signed Devontae Parker. I'm not as high on that move, but it's a low-risk move. They're only on the hook for $1.2 million. So you take a flyer on Devontae Parker. New England Patriots, I think, have to play him, have to pay him about $3 million. And anything's an upgrade. Anything is an upgrade to Quez Watkins. But I don't think they're done there. I still think you see the Philadelphia Eagles add somebody to compete for that wide receiver three, whether it's free agency, whether it's through the draft. They'll do something there. But again, we got to stay patient because we'll talk about that in a second. This is not what the team will look like come August. But the bigger move in free agency, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. CJGJ reunites with the Philadelphia Eagles. He apologized to the fans for calling us obnoxious and saying he hates those MFers. So he apologized. We forgive him. He's back. I like this move for a couple of reasons. One, I love his versatility. Chauncey Gardner-Johnson not only can play safety, he also can come down and play that nickel corner position. It's what he played early in his career in New Orleans, and he came down and showed us in 2022 he could do it when Avante Maddox got hurt. So now he adds that flexibility, having the ability to play safety or nickel corner, something this team may need. I also like that he brings that swagger back to this defense. He has that aggressiveness. He has that attitude that I think they were missing last year. You saw it. Debo Samuel talking trash all offseason, all year. He comes into Lincoln Financial Field. Not a single person, not a single person put a hit on him. CJ GJ at least tried when the Detroit Lions played, at least gave him a little hit after the whistle, let him know he was there. So I like that swagger that he brings back to this offense. But I do have some concerns. I don't want to see the Eagles be done at safety. For me, this isn't enough. I like it. I love bringing the guy back. I'm all for it. But this can't be all you do at the safety position. Because right now, the only safeties you have on the roster, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, Reed Blankenship, and Sidney Brown. Sidney Brown tore his ACL in Week 18. Reed Blankenship's been up and down. He's been hurt. He's played well at times. He's played bad at times. And what has Chauncey Gardner-Johnson done the last two seasons? He's missed games as well. He only played two or three games for the Detroit Lions. He missed some time when he was here in Philadelphia. Now, I know you could make the argument that they were kind of fluky injuries. Tore his pec this year in Detroit. Lacerated his kidney or liver when he was with the Eagles. But you can't have that as your only safeties. So there was a name a lot of people were floating. Connecting the dots with Justin Simmons, who played for Vic Fangio in Denver, who had good things to say. My understanding is they are out on him. His price tag is too high. My man Derek Gunn tweeted that out, that Simmons is no longer a possibility because of what he wants. There is still a young free agent safety that I would like to see them make a move for. The ideal situation for me would have been an Antoine Winfield Jr. He gets franchise tagged as expected. The other person I liked was Xavier McKinney from the New York Giants, who from all reports the Eagles were in on, but they got outbid by the Green Bay Packers. So for me now, the best option available is Cameron Curl. He's still only 24 years old. He's very good. Another player who I don't think has reached their potential yet, who's on the way up in his career, and he's still available. So we'll see if they can make a move for him. But I need something else at safety. You can't go into this season relying all on CJ and Reed Blankenship. I want another player. Cameron Curl would be the guy I would go after. So, you just heard me say, I want to see them bring in another safety. Well, what else do I want to see them do? What would be my next big move if I'm Howie Roseman and the Philadelphia Eagles? It's got to be a linebacker. You know, we all wanted Patrick Queen. He ends up going to Pittsburgh. But we saw last season how bad this defense was without good linebacker play. 
So that's something we need. I love the Barkley move. I like the Bryce Huff move. I'm all for bringing Chauncey Gardner-Johnson back. But this team needs to bring in a linebacker. The problem, though, is if you look around now, what's left in free agency, I don't want any of these free agent linebackers. I know there's some people out there. I see people in the chat talking about Devin White. I don't think Devin White is very good. You look at what he's done in Tampa Bay over the last five seasons, he hasn't been very good, and he was playing next to a really good linebacker in Levante David. He hasn't been very good. We're still holding on to what he did at LSU and why he was drafted in the top of the draft in the first round. I don't want Devin White. So what I need them to do is they need to make a trade. And from what I'm hearing, they are exploring possibilities. I don't know what linebacker is available in a trade, how he's going to have to do his homework, and he's going to have to go out there and try to talk somebody into trading a young player. Maybe they could pull off something like they did with A.J. Brown, where you have a player who's going to be entering that final year of their rookie deal. They're going to be in store for a payday, and the team that has them doesn't want to pay them that new contract. So we have a lot of draft capital. They'll probably pick up more draft capital when they trade Josh Sweat. So they got to do something at linebacker because you can't go into this season with N'Kobe Dean, Ben Van Sumeren, and even if they drafted a young rookie. And I see Stitch talking about Jordan Hicks. He reunited with Jim Schwartz in Cleveland, Stitch. So Jordan Hicks could have been a possibility, even though he's getting up there in years. He's He signed with the Cleveland Browns, reunited with Jim Schwartz. So. I still would like to see the Eagles draft a linebacker. I'm all for that. But even if you drafted a linebacker high in the draft, there's no guarantee that that player translates to the NFL. So then you would be going into this season with N'Kobe Dean, who's still a question mark, whether you're high on him or not, nobody can guarantee he's going to be able to play well at this level. Ben Van Sumeren, obviously, question mark, played fullback a couple years ago. And then whatever rookie you would draft, clearly a question mark because we don't know if that rookie is going to translate to the NFL level. So to me, they absolutely have to do something for a veteran linebacker. And when I say veteran, I'm not talking about a 30-year-old linebacker. I'm talking about somebody who's played in this league for a couple of seasons, who started in this league, who we know come week one, game one in Brazil, They got a playmaker at the linebacker position. And I want to turn the question mark at linebacker to an exclamation point. I want a playmaker. I want someone we can build around on defense because you've seen what good linebacker play can do for a team. What what it did for the Baltimore Ravens and the San Francisco 49ers and the Detroit Lions and the Kansas City Chiefs. There's a reason why those four teams were still standing. So we'll see if they do anything there. Now, I'm not in the school of thought that they need to add to the cornerback room because I think you could look at the Isaiah Rogers signing that they did last year as a free agent signing this season. So for those of you who don't know, most of you do, but last year Isaiah Rogers was suspended by the NFL for gambling. He was immediately cut by the Indianapolis Colts. Howie Roseman swooped in and signed him. When healthy, Isaiah Rogers was one of the best corners in the league. You look at his pro football focus grades from 2022 with the Indianapolis Colts. He finished with an 82.1 grade. There were only four corners in the entire NFL who played a minimum of 200 snaps that had higher. Sauce Gardner, Patrick Sertain, Jalen Ramsey, and Duke Shelley. So Isaiah Rodgers has the potential to be a number one corner in the NFL. He did it in Indianapolis. He's always played on the outside. Do they think maybe he could fit better as a nickel corner? I don't know. He's never done it before in this league. John McMullen here on Jacob Sports seems to think he could. The only question with Isaiah Rodgers is what does a year off do to his game? Is a year off going to affect his game at all? I don't think it will. I think the kid will be ready. But that, to me, is basically like a free agent signing for this team at corner. You still also have Darius Slay, who's playing at a high level. I know some people are down on him. We don't necessarily like his personality or the way he talks to the media or things he says about fans, but he can still play. Keely Ringo, 
Those of you who follow me know I'm very high on Keely Ringo. I think he battled as a fourth round rookie, young kid, 21 years old. He's got all of the attributes of a number one corner in this league. He's got size, he has strength, he has speed, he has ball skills. So I expect big things from Keely Ringo this year. You also have Zach McPherson coming back from his Achilles tear, a corner that a lot of people in the Eagles organization were high on this year, but he blew out his Achilles in training camp. Not to mention Eli Ricks, young, undrafted, battled last season. So you look at that cornerback room, even if they were to move on from James Bradbury, which I'll talk about the difficulty of that in a second, but even if they were to move on from James Bradbury, you have Darius Slay, Isaiah Rogers, Zach McPherson, Keely Ringo, and Eli Ricks. That's a pretty deep cornerback room. And now you've added Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, who has the versatility to also come down and play that nickel corner position. So I think they're fine at corner. So for me, it's safety and linebacker on defense that I'm looking at. But I know some fans want to see them trade James Bradbury. It's difficult. His cap hit for 2024 is only $4.3 million. But if you move on from him, Prior to June 1st, it skyrockets to $15 million. It actually would cost you $11 million to move on. Now, they could potentially do something post-June 1st, so maybe you see them unload him post-June 1st, and they could save, if they traded him, they would save about $1.2 million on the cap with a post-June 1st trade. But would they do that? And by would they do that, I mean another team. Would another team make a trade for James Bradbury in that contract? I don't think so not the way he played last year. So, John C. Gardner-Johnson, good move, but I still think they need linebacker, safety. I'm okay with the corners. But let's recap some of the other things that they've done. They took care of their own. Landon Dickerson was eligible for a new contract. So, to be eligible for a new contract in the NFL, you have to have completed three full seasons. So, all of the guys who were drafted in 2021 – are now eligible for their new deals. Landon Dickerson was one of those guys. They give him a four-year, $84 million extension, making him one of the highest-paid guards ever. That'll get passed the next time somebody signs. And there's some other players that also need to be extended because they're all entering the final year of their deal. Every player who was drafted in 2021. Milton Williams is another one. I'm very high on Milton Williams. I think he's going to get even better this season. Look out for that deal to get done because he's entering the final year of his deal, his rookie contract, and he's eligible for a new deal. Kenny Gainwell's also eligible. Not sure you'll see him get a new deal. Zach McPherson's eligible. Not sure you'll see him get a new deal yet either until he can prove that he can play. We haven't seen it yet. But the other big name of a player who's eligible, Devontae Smith. Everybody knows he's eligible, but you don't have to be nervous because Devontae Smith was drafted in the first round. What that means is that he has a fifth-year option. Landon Dickerson was drafted in the second round. He didn't have a first-year option. So there was no, excuse me, fifth-year option. So there was no way to keep Landon Dickerson here after this season. You could use the franchise tag, which the Eagles don't like to do. That's why they extended him. But Devontae Smith, you still can control his rights for two years. I know they want to get that deal done. They will get that deal done, but it's not necessarily a rush. You have them under contract this year. They have until May 2nd to exercise that fifth-year option. So really, they still control his rights for two years. It will get done, okay? Now, they also extended Braden Mann, their punter for two years, Rick Lovato, their long snapper, underrated position, and Jake Elliott. Jake Elliott, man, the most clutch kicker in the NFL, gets four years, $24 million. Well-deserved. Well-deserved. One of the clutchest kickers, in my opinion, probably the most clutch kicker in the NFL. I'm not being a homer there. We've seen it time and time again. You never worry about him when it comes to clutch kicks in big moments. So we're talking about some other things they need to do. And this is an hour show, so we're, we've got about 10 minutes left. So before we look over at the NFC and I give you the Eagles trivia question, there's all these other things they got to do, right? We want the Philadelphia Eagles to fill every single hole. And I'm trying to talk to myself here too, to try to stay calm and, and be patient. Because even though they do have all of these other holes to fill, 
it's only been, what, less than 24 hours since NFL free agency became official. So you look at 2017, when a lot of people say Howie Roseman had his best offseason, the year they went to the Super Bowl, the year they won the Super Bowl. The only two signings Howie Roseman made the day free agency kicked off, Torrey Smith and Alshon Jeffrey. Listen to some of the other moves he made and when he made them. Nick Foles. BDN. Freaking Nick Foles was signed four days after free agency started. Chris Long, edge rusher. We all remember him hitting Case Keenum's arm that led to the interception that got taken the other way for the pick six in the NFC Championship game. Well, Chris Long didn't get signed until three weeks after NFL free agency. And I just said that pick six the other way. Do you remember who the cornerback was who took it the other way in the NFC Championship game? Patrick Robinson. He was also signed three weeks after free agency started. LeGarrette Blunt, big role on that Super Bowl team. He didn't get signed until May 17th that year. <clears throat> so we have to be patient. In addition to those moves that were done weeks, sometimes months after free agency started, Howie also went to work in the trade market that year. Traded for Tim Cherrigan. That was in April. Traded for cornerback Ronald Darby. That was in August. Traded for running back Jay Ajayi. That was in the middle of the season on Halloween, October 31st. So you look at this team, just like I do. I want linebacker. I want another safety. I want another wide receiver three. I want a backup tight end that can help in the 12 personnel. There's all these things I want, but we got to be patient because sometimes Howie's best moves are done later. Same thing with 2022 when they went to the Super Bowl in 2022. The only player they signed the day free agency kicked off was Hassan Reddick. Then they signed Zach Paschal a week later. Not that he was a big part of that team, but he did some nice things. Two weeks later, Kazir White, who started linebacker for that team all year. James Bradbury, who I know now we're not happy with, but was a great player in 2022, wasn't signed until May in 2022. Linval Joseph, Nadama Kinsu weren't signed until November in the middle of the season. And two of the best moves Howie made that year were two trades. A.J. Brown was at the draft, and Chauncey Gardner-Johnson was in August. So we have to be patient. We do have to be patient. And I see on TikTok, Kerry asking, why do we need another safety? Is Reed and CJ not enough? So you may be just joining the show. Talked about that at length earlier. I, do don't, I don't think that's enough. I don't want to go into this season with only Reed Blankenship and Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, and you have Sidney Brown coming back from an ACL tear. I think they need more. I think they need another starter there. I'm not sold on Reed Blankenship just yet, and both Reed and Chauncey Gardner-Johnson have battled injuries. So we'll see. But let's stay patient. Let's stay patient. I do expect the Eagles to bring in a linebacker, but I think it'll be via a trade maybe around the draft. So the Eagles are getting better. They're not done. They still have a lot of moves to make, but they're not done. But some other teams in the NFC have made moves to get themselves better. So if you follow this show, you know that the team in the NFC that I have the most concerns about as the biggest competition for the Philadelphia Eagles in 2024, it's not the San Francisco 49ers. It's not the Dallas Cowboys. And it's not the Detroit Lions. For me, it's the Green Bay Packers. Green Bay is the team that I think is going to be the biggest competition for the Philadelphia Eagles. Now, if you also follow this show, you know that I'm not ready to anoint Jordan Love yet. I think he showed us a lot of great things last year, but he only did it for eight games. So we can't anoint him after eight games. I think he is going to be very good, but let's see what he does when defensive coordinators adjust, which they always do. But if Jordan Love can be the quarterback he looked like the last eight games, they're going to be a tough team to beat, and they got better. They made the move, outbidding the Philadelphia Eagles, apparently, from all reports, for probably the best safety on the market, Xavier McKinney, 24 years old, from the New York Giants. They also 
released running back Aaron Jones and brought in Josh Jacobs. Now, I liked Aaron Jones, but Josh Jacobs can really be a game changer, similar to a Saquon Barkley. So the Green Bay Packers are going to be a tough team to beat. They got better. Another team that got better, the Atlanta Falcons. Say what you will about Kirk Cousins. He is a massive upgrade to Desmond Ritter or whoever else was going to play for that team. I think they had they had the old commander's quarterback, and I'm drawing a blank on his name this year as well. Henneke playing some this year. So huge upgrade for them with Kirk Cousins. The Giants and the Cowboys have not really upgraded, but the Cowboys did make their first move, bringing in Eric Kendricks, the linebacker. They just don't have the money to do anything because of the Dak Prescott contract. And it was funny, his brother Tad Prescott tweeted out after the Saquon Barkley move, more evidence that the Philadelphia Eagles have the best front office in the NFL and then hashtagged, how about them Cowboys? So that was interesting. The Giants do make a nice trade for Brian Burns. I still don't think the Giants have a quarterback to compete in Daniel Jones, but Brian Burns was a nice move, giving up only a second and a fifth to get him, but they did give him a ton of money, but he's very good. But another team that made a lot of moves but still lacks a quarterback is in the NFC East. The Washington Commanders. We knew they were going to be heavy players in free agency. They had over $83 million to spend, but they bring in running back Austin Eckler. Center, Tyler Biadels. I think I'm saying his name right. I know who he is, but I don't know if I'm saying his name right. They brought in a left guard. They brought in tight end Zach Ertz. They brought in three edge rushers. They signed two linebackers that a lot of people had interest in. Frankie Louvu from Carolina. They brought in Bobby Wagner. We'll see what he has left. He did have a pretty good season last year in Seattle. They brought in safety, Jeremy Chin. They also brought in quarterback Marcus Mariota, but they're going to draft somebody, and that's going to be the question mark because they're building that team. They're bringing in a lot of players, but if you don't have a quarterback in this league, none of it's going to matter. But I appreciate everybody who tuned in today for the Legal Hands to the Face special edition free agency show. But like we end every Legal Hands to the Face show with a little – Eagles trivia. So in light of them bringing on Saquon Barkley, who we know can catch the ball out of the backfield, I went back and looked, and some of you may know this answer, but what running back holds the record for the most receptions in a single season in Philadelphia Eagles franchise history? And then as a bonus, how many catches did he have? So if you're here in the chat, I'll give you a second to answer. But which running back holds the record for the most receptions in a single season in Philadelphia Eagles franchise history? I knew everybody was going to get this. A lot of people on TikTok are checking in with it. A lot of people on YouTube as well. Yes, it's an easy answer. Brian Westbrook holds the record 2007. But does anybody know how many catches he had that year? So Saquon Barkley's rookie season, Saquon had 91 catches. In 2007, when Brian Westbrook set the record for the most catches in a single season, he had 90 catches. I see Stellar Blues on TikTok got it. My man Mike Fittery on YouTube got it. But everybody, reminder, make sure you're following me across all your social media platforms, not only here on TikTok, not only here on YouTube. Make sure you're following me on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and threads everywhere, because in addition to doing this show, I do the Philly Sports Power Hour, but I've also been appearing a lot on 97.5 The Fanatic, so I'll update you on Twitter when I'm going to be doing that, so you could check it out, maybe give me a call, and we can connect. But I appreciate everybody being here, spending two hours with me today, one hour here and one hour before on the Philly Sports Power Hour. I will be back on the Jacob Sports Network tomorrow, 10 o'clock, for the Philly Sports Power Hour, little Friday edition. So until then, go birds.